The first question was, you said in Revelation 13 that the beast equals a kingdom, but then we talked about how this kingdom is personating Jesus Christ, right? So let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's in the Old Testament. If you find the Psalms or Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you're going to keep going to the right toward the New Testament. And Daniel chapter 7 is what we're going to discuss. So if you're in Daniel chapter 7, you find it? Okay. Let me know if you need more time. I'll gladly wait. It doesn't bother me a bit. Oh, he's, he's looking. That's fine. So you're going to see in verse... I'm just going to get to the point here. I'm not going to add, add the context, but you're going to see in Daniel chapter 7, verse 3, four great beasts came up from the sea. Now, we already saw it together in Revelation 17, verse 15, when you're talking about water or a sea. What does it represent? That's right. Lots of people, a multitude of people. So these nations, these four beasts came up out of the sea. The nations came up out of populated areas, okay? That's what that means. Now, let's see from the Bible how you could say a beast equals a kingdom. Go to verse 17. It says in Daniel 7, 17, the, this is now the angel speaking to Daniel. The angel is interpreting. He says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Now, question. What is a king without a kingdom? He's just a regular guy, right? <laughs> so the king, the fact that there is a king demands that there's a kingdom. Now let's see that further though. Go to verse 23 as well. In the same chapter, Daniel 7 verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom. kingdom. Not just king, but kingdom. Because a king has a kingdom. If he doesn't have a kingdom, he's not a king. And so if you are reading the Bible and Daniel's given a vision, and then Daniel asks the question, what is this all about? God sends an angel. The angel interprets for him, oh, those four beasts that you saw? Those are four kings. Later he describes again, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom. And you're like, oh, you put the two together and you realize those are four kingdoms. And the different ways, times, and strengths that they come up with are described in Daniel 7 and 8. Very, very powerful. And also chapter 11. That's why when you go over to Revelation 13, this beast rise up out of the sea. Oh, I've been there. I've seen that. That means there's a nation that came out of a populated area. Right? So this beast comes up out of the sea. In verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. That's not really our focus. This next part is. And the dragon stood before the woman. Now get that in your mind now. You've got a dragon ready right here in front of a woman that's travailing in birth, ready to be delivered. Okay. So this big red dragon is ready. What to do what? Look at in verse 4 in the middle. It says, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, what happened when, we know that that child is Jesus, right? Because he was caught up to the throne to sit in heaven with the father. What happened when Jesus was born? How did the, some kind of kingdom, like a beast dragon type kingdom, try to attack Jesus when he was born? What happened? How the hell did they try to find him? Exactly. You go to Luke chapter 2 and you realize, Matthew chapter 2, and you realize that all the children from two years old and under, they were killed.
Herod was working for Satan. So what did the dragon represent as a whole kingdom? Rome, exactly. So Rome is the one that's the dragon there waiting to attack Christ who comes out of the, the belly of this Israelite woman. And as soon as it's, that child is born, Rome attacks all the children in Bethlehem. Why? Because they had caught word from the priests that Ma Mal uh, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that there's going to be a ruler that comes up in Bethlehem. Right? So the church and the state were working together. That's not a good thing. Church and state shouldn't work together. But that's what happened here. Rome got intel from the church. And as a result, they tried to persecute the faithful, which in this case was Christ. Okay? The church was also behind. The church was behind it. You can learn that 33 years later when they put him on a cross, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there was church and state united because... In chapter 12, there's Rome, and then there's Jesus Christ, and the church is all together. The church turns on Jesus Christ. Jesus is crucified, caught up to heaven. And then we have the woman, the faithful woman, running through the woods, and the dragon is chasing after the woman, trying to get a hold of her. And that's what Revelation 12 is all about. Now, Revelation 13, though, you see that this other beast that looks just like Rome. Wait a minute. But now... Listen, listen carefully. We saw the dragon with seven heads, right? Now, that was trying to attack the woman because it didn't like Christ and wanted to destroy Christ, right? You saw it. In Revelation 13, there's another seven-headed animal, a beast, but it's not trying to attack Christ. It's trying to look like him. Ah, who could that be? Looks like Rome comes from Rome, has seven heads like Rome, looking like Jesus. Well, let's think. Let's just think. What church, what church has a high priest that wears purple? Yeah, purple and red and white. Doesn't wear blue. You can see that in Revelation 17. She has plenty of gold, burns incense, has great big temples has angels all over the temples drawn by like Michelangelo and people like that, really important people. Has the golden cup, the golden cup right, in the Eucharist and, you know, those two beasts that are there. And it's just, it's amazing. You, you go through and the candles, the bread, the confession, all that stuff that is in the heavenly sanctuary is down here in a very personified or, or how would you say, um, you're trying to act like it's not person. Imposter. Impersonating. impersonating. Yes, that's what I was looking for. It's, it's impersonating the work that Christ is doing in heaven, but it's down here and there's no power. It looks just like what Christ is doing. You look at the sanctuary in heaven and it's very similar to the Catholic Church that came from Rome that has been given power by the beast before him. You see, if you know anything about Dark Ages history, the reason why the Catholic Church ruled for so long, 1260 days, actually 1260 years, is because the Roman power, the civil power, literally gave power to the church. And the church was able to rule because Rome gave power, seat, and great authority to the beast after him, the papacy. Justinian gave it over to... Uh, no, Justinian, yeah, gave it over to what Pope was that? Well, there is something like that in Ezekiel chapter 9. So remember the sanctuary, how it was laid out the way it was? There's the box like this, and then there's the, the most holy place, holy place and outer court. Mm -hmm. This was the entryway, which was the door, and that was always to be facing the east. The reason why is because the sun would rise from the east, right? 
And God was wanting people not to worship the sun, S-U-N, so he caused everybody to come to the sanctuary from the east heading toward the west. And so what's happening in Ezekiel 9 is that there are four major sins that are referred to, the greatest, most, or the last one, I couldn't say greatest, but the last one that's referred to, is that God's people are standing in the sanctuary worshiping toward the sun. Yeah. Yep. And so there's, there's idolatry at the end of time that's the real big issue. And it's a false S-O-N, it's the S-U-N. And that's the same issue that we're, we're facing today. Like you had mentioned yesterday when we were ending, you said, I got a ton of questions. And I think part of that may have been regarding the father and his son and the spirit, you know, how that all works together. Because that's what I was trying to focus on yesterday was trying to open up the minds a little bit to help us see that there is a false father. There is a false son. There is a false spirit. We want the real father, son, and their spirit, just as the dragon beast has a their spirit in the false prophet. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's really the issue is idolatry. And that's what God is calling his people away from today. Come out of her, my people. Yeah, along the sun god worship. Yep, that's right. Well, let's turn to Revelation 21. We'll go through this one quickly. And if there's any questions at the end, we can talk about that too. Revelation 21. I'm going to read verses 9 through 11 real quick. Revelation. And I've got all these notes that are available. All you got to do is ask and I can send you a PDF and you'll have them just laid out just like what we're going to do here, but probably making more sense. All right. So 9 through 11 of Revelation 21. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials of the seven last plagues. He talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So that, it's a beautiful picture. If you stop and think about it, you just try to imagine clear as crystal coming down from God, a beautiful city, all this stuff, you know, lots of lights, lots of glitter and gold and beauty. It really is, is a pretty picture. But then let's do one more thing here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something that's kind of interesting. Hold your finger in chapter 21 and go to chapter 17. Notice verse 1. Verse 1 says, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, this might be a little new to you, because, so you may not have noticed what just happened. But that verse was very similar to 21 verse 9. Did you notice it? It's the same angel. Yeah, watch. We're going to read 17 verse 1 again, okay? It says, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now go to 21 verse 9. Come hither, I will show thee. Yep. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. So what's happening in chapter 17 is there's one of the, angel, one of the seven angels that has the seven vials. He comes to John, saying, Come with me, I will show you a woman. In chapter 21... There's one of the seven angels that has the seven plagues or vials. And he comes to John saying, come with me. I'm going to show you a woman. Okay. Now the first woman in 17 is the unfaithful harlot. The woman in 21 is God's faithful woman. So there's an introductory to 17 and 21 with these two different women. Very similarly and that's on purpose. You see, God is trying to help us understand there's a similarity here. I didn't pick this up till many years ago, but I've gone over this so many times. It is just so clear in the Bible now. And um, it really makes a lot of sense. Now, 
Watch this. In 21 verse 9, just as you saw, the lamb's wife was focused on, right? In 17 verse 1, it's the great whore. One is committed, one is not. One is committed to a single person, which is Christ, the bride of the husband. The other one is not committed to anybody. She just wants pay. Okay. In fact, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 16, she doesn't even want pay. Is the woman the churches? Yeah, these are two churches. Yeah. So what you see here in 21 verse 9, it's, it's God's holy city, the new Jerusalem. And that would represent God's people. And here's how. Because Peter, in the book Peter, it talks about every one of us being a living stone to build up God's holy temple. So now some stones are bigger than others. Of course, Christ is the cornerstone, right? And the foundation is what? Built upon the apostles and prophets. So we have Christ the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets, and you might be right there in the front. You might be a small stone in the back. Doesn't matter, you're, you're a stone. You might be part of the ceiling. You might be part of the side. You might be right next to the door. You might be the one right next to Christ. It doesn't matter, you're one of the stones. But that's the point, is you... All of us are individual living stones that are actually building the temple of God. So every time somebody accepts Christ for real, the kingdom is built with one more brick. Okay? That's why it's so important that we would share the gospel with people. Share the real gospel. It's got to take place here first, and then you can share it. That's when it really matters. So anyways, that's how the, uh, the woman is illustrated as a temple. Okay? Yes. And the names of the 12 um, apostles are on the foundations. Yep. And so you can read about that in 21 of Revelation. But so what we'll see here is in chapter 21, verse 10, look at that again. 21, verse 10, it says, He carried me away in the Spirit. Okay. Look at 17, verse 1 again. Yep. He carried me away in the Spirit. Right? Isn't that what it says? Except it says it in verse 3. So he carried me away in the Spirit. So 17 verse 3 says he was carried away in the Spirit. 21 verse 10 says he was carried away in the Spirit. So there's another similarity there. And you're wondering why? Why is there a similarity? Well, just like, I'll give you kind of the end goal here. Just like we saw the Antichrist looking very much like Jesus Christ, we're going to see the apostate city looking like the holy city. Okay? Here's why. If you go into church sometime, you're like, wow, look at a name up there, a foundation, the walls, gold, glory. Whoa, this is amazing. I must be in God's church. Huh? You see a throne there. You see all kinds of stuff. It's a woman. You get, I mean, like they're in the wilderness. There's mountains. I mean, I, this, is, this is God's church for sure. Well, maybe not because God's church is being pers impersonated. And you're going to see from the Bible that Babylon, which is the unfaithful church, it's called Babylon, looks very much like New Jerusalem. And if you're not a student of God's word, you're going to be in this church thinking you're in the right one, but you're not. If you're not a faithful student of the Bible, you're going to be thinking you're worshiping the Father, but you're not. If you're not a faithful student of the Bible, you're going to be thinking you're worshiping the Son of God, but you're not. If you're not a student of the Bible, you're going to think you're, that you're filled with God's Spirit, but you're not. Okay? When, yes, you, when you say that, what, what, what is it that, that could trip us up and and by our own ignorance and, and, and get us to a place where we think we're supposed to be, but we're not. Is there any scripture you're thinking of that, that uh, could show us what, what you're talking about there? Yeah, two of them specifically. You, I think, mentioned it the other day. You like to use that verse where it talks about God's people are perishing for lack of oh, knowledge. Yeah, four, six. Right. You're the one that said that, right? Yes. So if you are ignorant 
on purpose, then you will perish because of that ignorance. Okay, Hosea 4, 6. But there's another thing. See, Christ, what, what is one of the things about Christ's life that's so amazing to the Christian? He lived without sin, right? So that's incredible. Like, because you, you've tried not to sin and you're failing. I know, and I, I sometimes fail too. We, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Christ did not. So Christ is the cornerstone of this kingdom. His whole victory was that he never went away from the Father. If you can come to that point where you love God so much that you would rather die than willingly commit sin, even in the realm of your thoughts, like Christ, then you will be able to gain victory as he did. Okay? It's about relationship. And not fall into any kind of temptation. Right, because if you choose sin, you're going to be in that kingdom, not this one. If you choose not to sin, God's going to be like, I can help you, I love you, you love me, let's do this. And he'll keep you from falling, as he says he would in Jude, verse 24. And you will not be in that kingdom. So really, a lack of ignorance, which means you're knowledgeable, and a lack of sinning, which means you're choosing Christ or God, either, more than Satan. That's the way to stay on the straight and narrow. Okay? If, if Christ would have sinned even a single time, he would have walked into the kingdom of Satan, showing that he was right, God was wrong, the whole thing would have failed. And so that's what God is looking for. If you're willing to follow him, you will be saved. I think we can say that's a, that's a you know. Sometimes it's a difficult battle. I mean, sometimes I feel I'm fighting my life. Right, and it is a difficult battle. It's because Satan is trying to pull you into hell as fast as he can. But, uh, yeah, but I know it. I ain't got the strength. I, I need you. I ain't got the strength. You'll have to fight him for me. I'll stand with you to hold on to your corners. That's right. There was the... As, as a human, yeah. we're not divine, so we're going to sin. Even though we try our hardest not to sin. We don't have to sin. I, I really believe we don't. And, and here's maybe a difference. I don't know you, so I'm, I'm not saying I understand. But there's a potential that there's a difference in our understanding of sin, what it is. Now, sin is not a state. It's like if I grab this right here, that is not sin. Unless, of course, I'm stealing it. But just right now, this is not sin. Now, if I was sin as a being, no matter what I did would be sin. Okay? Sin is a choice. It's an action. If I were to take this and, you know, kind of stick it in my pocket like that and walk out, that's sin. Because now I'm stealing it. It's, it's against God's commandments, right? But uh, the idea of having the victory over our choices is what God is asking us to have. So Christ was able to do that as a human. Now, I'm going to take a break from what we're talking about because you asked a really important question. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1 real quick. Hey, I turned right to it just like our friend last night. <laughs> yeah. 2 Peter chapter 1. It's not too far back from the book of Revelation. Now, this section of the Bible that we're about to read right now, I'll explain a little first before we read it. It contains two of the five times the word Godhead is used in the Bible. Okay? This little section. There's only four verses that we're going to cover. The word Godhead is not here because it's not translated Godhead. It's translated divine. That's actually how it should be translated. But the King James translators decided Godhead was the way to translate it. And each one of the five times the Bible uses the word Godhead in the Greek, three of those words are different. Okay? Okay. So three of those words are the same word. Two of them are other words. There's three separate Greek words for Godhead or divinity, divine. So here we're going to read two of them. And here's the point of this section. This is the only section of the Bible 
from Genesis to Revelation that makes it this clear on how we are to partake of the divine or Godhead nature. Okay? So you're going to read it right now. This is it. And, and I'm going to point out some of the how-tos. Okay? Verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained the precious faith with us, which would mean the Gentiles. The Gentiles have obtained the precious faith with us, which are Israelites, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ demonstrated the righteousness of his Father. You can see that in other places of the Bible. Verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the what? The knowledge. So grace and peace are multiplied unto you through something. It's the vehicle right here whereby grace and peace is multiplied is through knowledge. Okay? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Some people say, you know, it's not important to understand who God is and who his son is. There it is. Grace and peace is multiplied through the knowledge of God and his son. Verse 3. According as his, there it is, Godhead power. Okay, that word divine is Godhead. According to his Godhead power, he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through what? The knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So wait a minute. We get grace and peace through the knowledge. And then we get the divine or Godhead power through knowledge. Okay, notice verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the Godhead nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So it is, according to these verses, through knowing God, through knowing his son, whereby through the great or exceeding great and precious promises. The word of God itself is God's vehicle whereby you can partake of the divine nature. You will be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruptions that are in the world through lust. God's trying to get us away from lust, the wrong kind of lust. And you can gain victory over that through the knowledge of God in these exceeding great and precious promises, okay? So that's the how-to. That's why for 27 years as a minister now, I have been saying the same thing over and over and over. You've got to read the word of God for yourself. That's really the message that I wish everybody could learn. So, does that help? Okay, good. Sin is not a state, it's a choice. Righteousness is not a state, it's a choice. So if you're going to eat too much, you can choose, no, I'm not going to do that. That's just one very simple example, but you could choose, I'm going to sleep with her tonight. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm married. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look on that internet tonight. No, I'm not going to do that because God has called me not to. I'm going to drink tonight. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to lie. I'm going to steal. I'm gonna, whatever it is, you've got that choice. You don't have to do that. And sometimes, like you said, dear brother, you gotta just, you gotta wrestle, you gotta wrestle. I don't want to, I don't want to. I've been through all these st struggles. I know what it's like. I'm a human too, just like everybody else. But God has given victory. I'll promise you God has given victory. I don't sin regularly. If I do, it's like a frustration and I'm like, Lord, you know, Lord, I'm sorry. I apologize to who I was frustrated with, but I'm not, I know how to go and sin. I know how to do that. I'm no fool. I could sin tonight. You know what I'm saying? But I don't want to. It's not who I am anymore because I've been studying God's word and it's just in my head. This is what's right. That's not right. I'd rather choose what's right. Amen? You remind me of that Psalm of David. I have, I, have, um, I, have hit, I have got you in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Right. That's, I can't. Now, now listen. Yes, it's Psalm 119, verse 11. But what it says is, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Yeah, and it's like, just like you said, that's a protection. The word. Just pointing it out. Yep, 
The word of God is, is our protection. That's what Jesus did when Satan came to him in the uh, wilderness of temptation. Satan was trying to push his spirit, his mind, his thoughts, his motives onto Christ. Come on, you don't have to do this. Now just, you know, use your divine power for self and make those stones into bread. You're hungry. You can do this with the power that God has given you. Go ahead, use it for self. And Jesus, what did he do? It is written. That's exactly what he did. He used God's word to push that spirit against the oncoming spirit. Nope, not interested. God has spoken. It is written. You see, there's power in God's word. I'm telling you, there's power in God's word. So going back now here to uh, Revelation 21. You've already read it. It says in verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit into a great and high mountain, right? Well, do you remember in the other section, 17, it says he was carried away in the spirit. It says in verse three, into the wilderness. Now it doesn't say great and high mountain in chapter three, 17, verse three. But I'm guessing that the wilderness has mountains. Is that fair to say? Okay, so... If we've already seen one of the seven angels with the seven last plagues comes and says to John, come here, I'm going to show you a woman. It was in the spirit that he took me away into. thing so it is interesting because look at 17 verse 9 since we're talking about it since we're talking about the mountains notice it says in verse 9 and, and this is actually in the section where it talks about the wilderness it says in verse 3 in verse 9 here is the mind which has wisdom the seven heads are what seven mountains, seven mountains on which the woman sits wait a minute I thought the woman was sitting on the red, uh, scarlet colored beast. Well, she is. And those, uh, what does it say? The, what was I just, the heads are mountains. Now, wait a minute. Who is the seven, the, the city of seven hills? Rome, Rome exactly. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? You know what's also interesting? If you do your history, uh, rather your geography study, you will learn that Jerusalem also sits on seven hills. Let me, let me show that real quick before you take that question. Watch this. Go to Psalm 133, verse 3. Psalm is in the middle of the book. Psalm 133, verse 3. The dew of Hermon... And as the dew that descends upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commands the blessing, even life forevermore. It says it also in Song of Solomon. Uh, no, sorry, that's something else. But the point is that Zion has mountains, plural. It's not just Mount Zion, the mountains of Zion. Do your homework, look it up. You'll find that in that area, there's seven mountains. And there's seven mountains in Rome too. There's seven mountains in a lot of different places, but Babylon and Jerusalem are the focus. And it's pretty clear that there's seven in both. So I think that's really fascinating. Well, yes, sir. That might be a little, it's, well, it's a little confusing to me. Sometimes they talk about mountains. In prophecy, is a mountain a nation? A mountain is a nation, yes. A kingdom of sorts. Yeah, when they say bunches of mountains, now, what I'm thinking, does that mean physical mountains or is that several nations. I think you can see it both ways. Yeah. It's got to kind of con take the context, right? Yeah, it, it definitely means more that it's seven kingdoms. Now these are seven heads that are part of that one kingdom. It's not yeah, seven different seven kings. Mountains, I was wondering if it was seven nations that were affiliated with Rome. I would think it's more of and I'm I'm learning this over the years, but I think it's more of a seven types of kingdoms of Rome. Different time periods? Yeah, different, different 
uh, how would you say, facets of their leadership. And here's why, because even in Daniel chapter 7, where you have that, those four beasts, right? The third one, how many heads does it have? The lion with eagle's wings that has, not the, not the lion, the uh, leopard that has eagle's wings, four. four heads, right. So what do those four heads represent? Do you remember in Daniel chapter 8? Four generals. Of four generals. Now, those generals were all Grecian, weren't they? Yes. Okay, so four heads on one Greece beast. You see what I'm saying? Seven heads on one Roman beast. Got it? So now that makes biblical sense. I, I have thought about you like you in the past where there's seven different nations in kind of an affiliate um, historic timeline, but I can't see that anymore. It, I have to now stick with the seven heads on one beast, four heads on one beast. Okay, so, so seven, seven factions of, so of one kingdom. Right. Right. There, there was like Imperial Rome, yep. and Papal Rome, mm -hmm. and Pagan Rome, and then the Republic of Rome. Yep. All those could be part of those seven heads. Yes, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. I don't know those details very well, but that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, looking at our next thought here, the um, there. Look at. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Remember in 21 verse 10, we had just read where it says, he saw or showed me that great and high mountain. Remember that? It says in verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And then it says, and he showed me that great city. Now, Jerusalem is actually named right there, that great city. Well, wait a minute. Turn to chapter 17, verse 18. 17, verse 18. It says, The woman which you saw is exactly that great city. <laughs> so 17, verse 18, the very last verse of chapter 17 tells us that the harlot is that great city. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jerusalem was that great city. Yes, they're both that great city. One's in the mountains, the other one's in the mountains. One was introduced by one of the seven angels. The other one was introduced by the seven angels. One of the seven angels. The great city is Babylon is what it's referring to. Yep. One's the great city. One's the great city. One has mountains. The other one has wilderness, which is mountains because we saw that in verse 9. And then you can just go and, and see how many different parallels there are. One was having to take John carried away in the spirit. The other one is having to take John carried away in the spirit. You see? And then um, let's see the next one here. Oh, they both have names, um, which would be a title for them. What is God's holy city name? Do you remember that? New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, new Jerusalem right? It's actually called the holy city, um, the new Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. Or the holy Jerusalem, is, I think is what it says in verse 21, verse 10. Yep, it's called the great city, the holy Jerusalem. You see it there? Mm -hmm. Well, now let's see what the other one is named. Because it's 17 verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, if she's a mother, what does that mean? She's got, she's got at least a daughter, but it says mother of harlots. So she's got daughters. Yeah. So she has daughters. Guess what? Israel has daughters too. You want to see it? Now, keep your finger there, but go to Song of Solomon. That's a hard one to find. And verse 11. It says in chapter 3, verse 11, Go forth, O you daughters of Zion. That's all you need to read. Zion has daughters. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Zion is Jerusalem, by the way. You know, the, the city. There you go. Oh, that's even better. I, I need to mark that one down. Thank you. And so um, you can see it elsewhere too in like Isaiah 3.16. We won't go there as well, but it's the same thing. The daughters. And um, the, the, the point is, and there's more to this. Uh, they both have gold. They both have foundations. They both have, quote, precious stones. They both have the glory. 
They both have daughters or mountains, etc. So there's lots of comparisons. The whole point of this study is to show that though there is a kingdom that looks Christian, it's not necessarily God's church. There, if there, did, what did I say? If there's a church that looks Christian, did I say that? It's not necessarily God's church. There is a real church that looks Christian as well. That is God's church, but you got to know the difference between what's not right and what is because of what God's word says. Now, there was a mention, this is going to take a lot of study. It does. Uh, this one took me a long time to see in its, in its completeness here, and I still add to it. But uh, it's all there when you have the notes and you can just read it along and see the different comparisons. It just, wow, there's, there's a lot there. So, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely send it to him. Send it to her. Yeah, she, he was just wondering if you could get the notes, and I said I will definitely send them. And then she'll have them. She'll be the kind of the hub for you guys. Or you can go to revelationwithdaniel.com and you can find them there too. Though it's maybe a little harder to search because I know the keywords. I call it the fraud head. I don't call it the God head. This is the fraud head. You see the fraud head of the father, the son, and their spirit. They have a kingdom. The Godhead of the father and son with their spirit. They also have a kingdom. So it's the Godhead versus the fraud head. And that to me makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yep. That's right. That's Revelation 16. So now, are there any questions as a result of our time together? The trumpets are, remember, in the, uh, you've got Jesus 7, Jesus 7, Jesus 7. This is the first coming of Christ to the second coming. First coming to the second coming. First coming to the second coming. So this, the churches are following this history the civil nations are following this history and the trumpets, which would be the war history is following that same time. So we're actually currently in right now, we're in the sixth trumpet. Okay. And uh, there are ways to show that that are astounding. In fact, do you know anything about the history in North America uh, of what's called the great awakening? There was a great religious awakening in the 1840s, 1830s, 1840s. In 1840 specifically, August 11th, the sixth trumpet was foretold by a guy named Litch or Fitch. Josiah Litch. Was it Josiah Litch? I get, I get those two mixed up, Fitch and Litch. Josiah Litch actually foretold some days in advance that the Ottoman Empire would be given over to the Christians, to a Christian nation. They would be defeated. And sure enough, on that very day, the day he pointed out, that doesn't mean he's a prophet, he just understood prophecy. There was a, uh, a day, August 11, 1840, where the um, Ottoman Empire yielded itself to a Christian nation. And that was one of the impetuses, one of the ways that the gospel was spread around the world during that time. So, but there was already religious awakening before that, but that was like another major move in that. That's interesting because that actually is in the sixth trumpet, a prophecy that was using time, prophetic time. And it led their studies to um, August 11, 1840, which means we're still in that trumpet because the seventh trumpet hasn't happened yet. The seventh trumpet is beginning to sound, which is in Revelation 10, you can read about that, which is weird because Revelation 10 is... What's in the interlude here? So here, let me open this up. You have one through six. Remember, there's an interlude and then seven mm -hmm. in all of these, but in the seals and the trumpets, it's easier to see. Well, right in the interlude of the trumpets in chapter 10, it talks about the mystery of God being completed when the seventh trumpet shall begin to sound. So it's not like it sounds and all of a sudden we're in the midst of the seventh trumpet. Oh, no, no, no. You know what I'm saying? It begins to sound. And so I'm not sure exactly how that sounds, but the idea is it doesn't just blast. It begins to sound. So it's these trumpets, seals, and churches, they don't necessarily have to begin with an event. It's more like in the seals, for example, the white church which is purity, 
becomes red because it starts to be persecuted. But it wasn't like everybody's red and all of a sudden the next day they're, I'm sorry, everybody's white and the next day they're red. The white church started being persecuted, so it started turning red. Pretty soon it's red. Well, that church started apostatizing because it didn't want to be persecuted so much, and it started turning black. Now, the black church ended up being pale. You see, like we're going further, further into apostasy, into the Middle and Dark Ages. And that's what happened during the churches, and then this, the trumpets are the war history. So, yeah, that's how it fits in. There's a book that I'm, I have in my mind right now, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation. It was written by a man named Uriah Smith. He lived in the 1800s. And in that book, you could read it like verse by verse through the book of Daniel chapter 8 and also chapter 11. And those, I have it online if you're interested. Do me a favor though. If you're going to get that book, get the first version of it. Do not get the... Uh, altered version of it from the 1940s. You want to get the original. I have that copy um, PDF format, which is a very th small footprint, like uh, just a couple of megabytes. I also have one that's scanned, where every page of that book is scanned, and you can see the actual re uh, writing from the original 1897 version of that book. Okay. History is what I've always loved. And you're going to love this stuff then. Yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be done now. I have now. a lot of new centuries at the house, and I've read it. I didn't I remember this being in there when they found it there. Yeah, okay. okay. So the, 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 there's two times it fell. There's a prophecy. I'll read it. I'll read the prophecy to you. Go to Lou, Revelation 16. And you'll be like, what? And just like I was, what? But it doesn't matter. Sorry, chapter 9, not chapter 16. Revelation chapter 9. And it's in verse 15. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for, here's where this guy, Josiah Litch, was focusing in on, for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. But then it goes on and talks about the 150, where's that one? Because there's 150 years that is focused on. It's called five months. There it is in verse 10. They had their tails like unto scorpions and they were stings with their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, a month in the Bible is 30 days. Okay. Five times 30 is 150. A day in prophecy equals a year. So we're talking about 150 years. Okay. And then he goes and he, you know, the as it said there in verse 15, with the uh, hour, day, month, year, etc., that brings you to 391 years and 15 days. So when you do that, that math, if you will, it leads you to that kind of prophecy. So he was able to go through that and really come to a point where everybody saw it, everybody knew he said it, it happened. And there was a great movement in Christianity as a result. Okay, not, he wasn't the beginning of the movement, but he was adding to the fact that something had already stirred. That was in the 1830s and 40s called the Great Awakening. Yeah. A lot of people will hear about the ceiling as though it's only applicable to the 144,000. It's not. The ceiling, like for example, in the book Ephesians, in the book... Um, Corinthians, I don't remember all the locations right now, but I do know when it says you were sealed. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 real quick. And we're going to look at verse 13. In whom you also trusted, which was Christ. You can see that in verse 12. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were, what? Sealed. You were sealed. Past tense, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what's fascinating <laughs> is that Ezekiel and Revelation both explain the angels are the ones that seal you. That's cool. Instead of God, the Holy Spirit, it's the angelic ministry. That doesn't make the angels the Holy Spirit, but they are the living beings whereby the Holy Spirit is enabled. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Since you brought up the scorpions, we'll look at the scorpions for a second. 
Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Jesus is actually giving a commission to his um, disciples. And they've come back and they're all excited, like, hey, we, you know, they, they listen to us like the demons leave when we tell them. And it says there in verse 19, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and what? Scorpions. scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Serpents and scorpions are equated with demons. Okay? So when it's talking about in Revelation chapter 9, that there's stings in their tails, there's scorpions, and people are bitten, but they don't really die, even though they want to. It's demon attacks, demonic attacks, demon oppression. You're not going to read about that. You're not going to read about that in the news. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at it as a... Uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that takes, a, takes some study is to not look at something very literally and to look at what the meaning of it instead of it actually being scorpions actually stinging men, going out in the world and stinging men. Right. So that when you're in prophecy itself, these are symbolic sections of the Bible. Like, for example, a day for a year equals in prophecy, but not just Jesus walked for a day. That doesn't mean he walked for a year. That's a history. So prophecy is to be understood lit symbolically, whereas the biblical history, and some of the book of Revelation is actual history or a description of what's actually occurring, well, rather than... Be more careful than my reading. Yeah, and it takes just prayer and, and continued study and God will reveal you to, to you exactly what it is. That says, that's what it says in John 16, verse 13. When he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Anyways, so what do you think? What kingdom do you want to be in? Christ's or antichrist's? Christ. Amen. Me too. <laughs> it's a big deal. It really is because now you've seen from the book of Revelation yourself that the enemy has a huge system that's set up that looks just like it's God's, but it's not. And so that's what's so sad because like people are wondering like, how can so many be so wrong? You're wondering, Noah was in the boat saying, how can so many people be wrong? Right? Daniel in the lion's den, how could so many people be wrong? The three faithful Hebrews in the fire, how could so many people be wrong? A remnant at the end of time, the, the very few last of her children are wondering the same question. How can so many be wrong? It's not about multitudes. It's about truth. The biblical Sabbath Saturday. Yeah. That is a real truth. Jesus kept Sabbath. The apostles kept the Sabbath. The people at the end of time will keep the Sabbath. Where did we go wrong there? Uh, Roman church actually made it, made it, they mandated two things. Okay, watch this. This is history that's, that's verifiable. In 321, Constantine wrote a law, 321 AD. His name is Constantine. He wrote a law. He wrote a law that demanded that everybody honor the venerable day of the sun, which was Sunday. And he wrote in that law, except for the people that keep their, you know, fields. They can work because we all have to eat. Well, that was a little bit of a, you know. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, a little bit of a compromise. But what's interesting is only four years later, in 325 AD, which is in the Council of Nice or Nicaea, the Nicaean Council, that's where they introduced the Trinity Doctrine. So Sunday keeping and the Trinity came into our Christian church about the same time. And that right there, 321 and 325, is today why all the churches in the world, almost all of them, worship on Sunday and believe in the Trinity. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that happened is when the Roman church gave power to the ecclesiastical church, which was the Church of Rome, the Catholic church, they started demanding that if you believe differently, you would be killed. Okay, that's all the persecutions that came in the Dark Ages. Oh, there was a bunch. It was all religious, okay? And if you didn't believe in the Trinity, or if you worshipped on a different day, or did not pay your, what do you call that? Um, yeah, tithes, of course, but the, uh, what is that called? The They would sell the... 
Oh, indulgences? Indulgences, yes. If you, if you went against that, you were killed. It was about money. It was about power. It was about prestige. And it was about lies because they took the Bible away from the people. They did, absolutely. And so you have, you have in the history of Martin Luther, remember him? He actually first read a Bible. His heart was beating because he was so excited to get in his hands a Bible. It was chained to the pulpit. You couldn't take the Bible home. Oh, no, that was for the church. And the church was to introduce it to the people through Latin and various things similar to what they still do in the Orthodox churches today. But yeah, you didn't get the Bible. It says in Revelation 7, verse 1, After these things I saw four angels. These are actually angels, God's ministers. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the east. That word ascending from the east, it's like the sun rising. It, it will start with a little bit of an orange type, then it turns yellow pretty soon. It's white and it's brighter. Okay, that's, it's, that's the idea of ascending from the east. He's having the seal of the living God. Now, who's the living God? You do your homework. The living God is the Father. Now, Jesus is our God. I believe that because he's divine. But he was not always living. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus died. So there was a time where he was not the living God. But there is a living God that has never died nor will die. That's the Father. He's immortal. Only God alone. Is immortal. Only God alone that's right. And so we have the, this angel ascending from the east like the sun rising, having the seal of the living God. Well, since we talked about the sealing earlier and the angels being involved, I'll continue reading. And it says, And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Saying, notice what he says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So who are the ones sealing the servants of our God? The angels, that's right. You just read it for yourself. Same thing happens in Ezekiel 9. But then notice what happens in chapter 14. We're going to read about that same group that are sealed. Yeah, Revelation 14, verse 1, again, it says, I looked, and lo, a lamb. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus Christ. I looked, and a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, which is Zion in the Old Testament with Z, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Wait a minute. I thought the angels put a seal in their foreheads. He, they did. What is that seal? It's the Father's name. Because remember, he, they had the seal of the living God. It's the Father's name in their foreheads. Now, what does your forehead represent? What is, what is that? Like a stamp here? No, it's not a stamp. It's your mind. It's you. It's your person. The Father's name or character. That's what the word name means, character or authority. The Father's name will be in your forehead. That means in your mind. the an angel ministers are here to help us, to keep us from falling, because in their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Those angel ministers are here to help us to have the Father's character in our lives. If we have God's character in our life, we are sealed. If we don't have God's character in our lives, we are not sealed. I'm going to continue just for a moment and then I'll let you go. There is a verse in John 14, 15. I'll just quote it for you. If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So if we love God or Christ, we're going to keep the commandments. If we don't love God or Christ, what's going to happen? We're not going to keep the commandments. That's where... Obedience to the commandments, as I was mentioning the other day, is important because God is calling us to obey. That includes all of them, not just nine out of ten. The ones that most churches will say are okay are nine out of ten. The one they say you shouldn't keep is the one that God said to remember, which is the seventh-day Sabbath. So 
Keeping the seventh day Sabbath is actually, here, here's, now that you understand a little bit about the dragon and the beast, the dragon has a son that he gave everything to, power, seat, great authority, right? The dragon has a son. Well, you could say the father has a son. Well, my father in heaven has a son too, that he gave power, seat, and great authority to. Each of them are a father. This is the father of lies. This is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of truth. Because the Bible actually teaches Jesus is the truth. So we have the fathers having a son. And it makes it clear that at the end of time, you will either worship the beast and his image, or you will worship the father and his image. The way you worship the father and his image is by keeping the commandments. The way you worship the beast in his image is by keeping their commandments. The big issue at the end of time will be worshiping the sun. Ezekiel chapter 9. 8, sorry, Ezekiel chapter 8. And in, so watch this. Ezekiel chapter 8 is worshiping the sun. The very next chapter is the seal of God. God's people are being sealed because they're crying out against the evils that are being done. Does that make sense? So it's really about character. Character on God's side will lead you to obey him 100%. Character on Satan's side will lead you to disobey him 100%. Except the problem with, with this is you could obey him 90% and still have 10% over here. You look like a Christian, but really you're not a Christian. So it's, it's got to be 100% or it's nothing at all, right? That whole illustration of one glass of juice with a teaspoon of poison. The whole thing is bad. How does that keep you from buying things? Like it says in the Bible. Buying and still buying yeah. ourselves. Right. So we saw it with COVID. That was preparatory to the future fulfillment of those specific prophecies of Revelation 13 that you're talking about. You won't be able to buy or sell. Like you were unable to buy or sell in some locations, like for Costco, for example. You wouldn't be able to buy if you didn't come in with a mask, right? You remember that? I went through it. I know. I went into Costco. They said, no, you have to have a mask. I had to put on a mask. If I didn't put on a mask, I could just walk out the door and I wouldn't be able to buy or sell. Period. And so that was a very, very similar kind of activity, except now going digital with like the whole world talking about going to the digital dollar. If you're not showing up at church and giving your tithe and you're traced electronically, then you won't be able to buy or sell. You see, it's going to be very simple. Click the switch. Oh, he's not at church. No, he's not either. There you go. They're blocked.